welcome everybody to, uh, to this combined Welcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics and Centre for First Life Medicine guest lecture. Um, it's a huge pleasure to introduce uh, this um, and Chandler to this audience. Chandler is an investigator at the Moffitt Cancer Centre, the Integrated Mathematical Oncology Unit at the Moffitt Cancer Centre, who I think you know, really have done uh, more than anybody else in the world to in integrate molecular data, imaging data, evolutionary dynamic data and math models together. Uh, to form really important translational in, uh, insights and implications. So Charm has been right at the centre of that. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say he's going to tell us all about this really nice paper that is on by, uh, by archive and is doing the circulation amongst the top tier journals, looking uh, in carcinoma and adenoma sections, so, so bits of adenoma and bits of cancer, uh, looking to show that the immune suppressive niche uh, is, uh, is really integral and important at the onset of COVID cancer. Chandler, welcome to Oxford. It must feel, even on a day like this, it must feel like winter for you coming yes. to Florida. But we're very <laughs> pleased to have you here, and thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you, Simon, for the very kind introduction and the invitation to come speak. So, as you know, colorectal cancer has traditionally been found as a uh, mutationally driven disease. So you get a few driver mutations and adenoma forms, Couple more driver mutations, carcinoma, the basis. Um, but recent work has um, found that you, these cells can have many driver mutations, but they don't progress to cancer. Um, and then we also know that many adenomas don't progress to cancer. And aside from that, we also know that the immune system uh, plays an important role in tumor progression. So it can, you know, attack the tumor and remove it potentially, and it can also help it grow. And in response, the tumor can involve these uh, escape mechanisms. So we believe that these two observations are tied together um, so that the thing that's preventing these loaded uh, uh, tumor cells from evolving into a, an aggressive carcinoma is the immune system. And we're going to test this hypothesis, sort of taking like a three-pronged approach. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, we developed a computational model that predicts the uh, expected relationship between the tumor ecology and the level of antigenetic uh, heterogeneity. So same thing as genetic heterogeneity, but in this case, we're focused uh, explicitly on antigens. Uh, so the model will give us these predicted patterns, and then we can go to the data and look for these patterns. So we'll describe the tumor ecology using immunohistochemistry. And then we can describe antigen burden using neoantigen predictions. Okay. So let's start off with the model. Um, you know, the immune system is insanely complex. So we had to boil it down to this very, very, very simple model to make it tractable. Um, and in this model, it's specific for colorectal cancer. So we have three different types of cells in our population. So we have the normal epithelial cell. Uh, we have adenoma clones, which um, would grow on top of the epithelium. And then we have the carcinoma clones that can invade, you know, across and down uh, through the epithelium. So this, um, and, and these interact, in this picture on the left, these red bars indicate um, inhibitory interactions and green ones are promoting. So in this case, we have, right, the adenoma clones compete with the carcinoma and carcinoma competes with normal, but normal and adenoma do not compete because they occupy different spaces. Um, so these are sort of the cell-cell interactions uh, within the epithelium. And then the cells can stimulate a T cell response. And then the T cells come in and attack the clones, can reduce the tumor size, but then the tumors can also recruit immunosuppressive cells, which suppress T cells, and then can promote tumor growth through release of growth factors, promotion of angiogenesis, et cetera. Uh, so this is, this is how we've boiled down the immune system, just trying to make it as simple as possible. Okay. And of course, it's a it's model, so we have to write us some equations. Um, right, so this is sort of, this is sort of the, just the basic outline. It's, um, if you're familiar with the Locke Volterra model, uh, it's the, the traditional model based on like links in hair, predator-prey interactions. So in this case, the T cells are the predators, tumor cells are prey, and then we have this mutualistic interaction between immunosuppressive cells like macrophages and neutrophils and the tumor cells that can recruit them. So, uh, 
Right, so it's a fairly simple model, uh, considering some other ones that are out there. Uh, but don't need to dwell on this too much, because it's more the idea of what this model does. Um, <clears throat> so the unit of selection in this model is a clone, which is composed of um, genotypically identical cells. So this clone will grow and compete with the other clones based on its uh, position in the uh, colon. And it can mutate, but when it mutates, uh, most of the time it's, it's a deleterious mutation and generates a new antigen, which increases predation. Um, and these antigens accumulate over time, so there's strong selection against um, increasing immunogenicity. But there are three possible beneficial mutations. Uh, one of them uh, can be to acquire a driver mutation, which if you get two uh, epithelial, evolves into an adenoma clone, you get two more, it evolves into a carcinoma clone. And these driver mutations, uh, well, has two effects. One is if it switches species, so from epithelial to adenoma, it occupies a new niche and can grow into a new area. Um, and it also has an increased division rate. Um, some other mutations it can have is it can evolve the ability to block the immune system through something like pd one or CTLA-4. So that will reduce immune predation. And then it can also, again, recruit these immunosuppressive cells. So that would inhibit the T cell response, or the cytotoxic T cell response, and increase the growth rate. Um, okay, so, um, what this model does is you start off with one clone, and it divides and mutates, and you generate this uh, branching process, basically. All that really means is it's the branching process of evolution. So uh, over time, you get basically, I don't know, like a phylogenetic tree, uh, except in this case, it's specifically for antigens. Um, and then up here on these, uh, these plots are two examples of the simulation. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with these, these are uh, Mueller plots. So the area of the polygon reflects the population size. And then the nestedness is the evolutionary relationship. So all these purple and blue ones um, came from the large blue cone, which came from the green cone. Um, <clears throat> so this, you can kind of see that um, in this example, um, in the plot underneath, you can see the different events. So the first one was it created immunosuppressive cells, and then it evolved into a carcinoma, so there was this big population expansion, and then it could block T cell attack, which really reduced predation and selection gets removed, and you have this sort of turns neutral, I guess. Um, right, so this Mueller plot over here, and at this time point, it started to recruit immunosuppressive cells, and then here it evolved into the carcinoma. You have the population explosion, and then blockade, basically removes immune predation. So all the, the cells, there's no selection against antigenicity anymore and they just coexist. Um, so this is an opposite scenario where um, the tumor did not evolve any escape mechanism. So it relied on getting lucky and only collecting antigens that had low recognition potentials. So it's trying to fly under the radar. Um, and this creates a, a different pattern of um, antigenic heterogeneity, which we'll get into more detail in a minute. But given this model setup, there's sort of uh, three extreme strategies. Uh, the first one is, like it was just saying, the get lucky strategy where clones survive by being fortunate enough to have an antigen that has low recognition potential. And they accumulate, so it has to be this series of like fortunate events. Uh, an alternative is to get smart and evolve the ability to recruit immunosuppressive cells or express pd one something to create an immunosuppressive niche. Um, and this third strategy is to simply rely on the driver mutations to outdivide predation, right? So any three of these seem possible. And we can use the model then to predict which ones, uh, which pattern of ecology and antigenic heterogeneity we see with each strategy. And then we'll look at that in the data. So let's get to what these patterns look like. Okay. So <clears throat> let me take a minute to explain these plots. They are 
violin plots, of course. Um, on the y-axis is the trait that we're looking at. In this case, it's recognition potential. Um, and the violin plot is split in half. So this left side is how strongly is it, or the growth benefit it would receive from uh, recruiting immunosuppressive cells and getting growth factors. Uh, and on the right side is the protection it would get um, from, again, recruiting immunosuppressive cells and expressing it, um, checkpoint inhibitors. So the brighter the color here, the smarter it is. And the darker the color, the more it relies on getting low antigenicity. Um, so the takeaway message here is <clears throat> that, um, first of all, this do nothing strategy is supposed to, you know, supposed to be like, it wasn't fortunate enough to get low antigenicities and just try to out divide predation. Um, so you get very high recognition potentials and right, no sort of escape strategy or anything. And it turns out that all of these tumors, this XCRA, are uh, simulated carcinomas that went extinct. So simply trying to outdivide the immune system, relying solely on driver mutations, they, they didn't make it very far. Um, whereas the ones that progressed either did have to rely on this get lucky or get smart strategy. So right, the smarter it gets, the higher the recognition potentials can be. And the more it relies on being lucky, the lower recognition potentials have to be. And that makes sense, right? It's just basically um, decreasing the death rate if you don't have someone to actively protect yourself. Um, and similar pattern over here with uh, clonal diversity. So just Shannon's index. So, you know, what's, you know, the probability of reaching in the population and pulling out a different clone if you did it two times, sort of. Um, <clears throat> so if it's smart, you have a very diverse tumor, very heterogeneous. If it <clears throat> relies on getting lucky and have the low antigenicity, it's very homogenous, so dominated by one clone. All right, so that's one pattern that, uh, of antigenic heterogeneity that the ecology can leave on the tumor. And we can also look at antigen burden <clears throat> in the same way. So the adenomas that went extinct, they didn't last very long. So the burden is very short. It's kind of like a flash in the pan. Um, the tumors that rely on getting lucky have low antigen or low burdens because again the antigens are inherited. So um, you know they may all have small recognition potentials, but they add up, and eventually it ends up being too much. But if the tumor can protect itself by creating this immunosuppressive niche, then you can have these increased antigen burdens. Um, and over here on this side, we can see that um, these are the antigen burden also, but colored by recognition potential this time in the color bars over here. So you can see that pretty much it's, it's always this dark purple because low antigenicity is always favored. So generally should expect selection for lower antigenicities because in the model, uh, predation is never actually zero, right? Um, so there's always going to be favoritism for low antigenicity. Okay. And finally, one thing we can pull out of the model is if we look at the transition time between the carcin or the adenoma and how long it took for it to evolve into a carcinoma, uh, what we see here is that um, <clears throat> if it relies on getting lucky, it takes a long time to get the balance between having the correct number of driver mutations and low antigenicity. So the transition time is much longer than if it's able to construct an immunosuppressive niche. So basically, if it has this immunosuppressive ecology, uh, antigenicity doesn't matter anymore. Just get the driver mutations when you get them and progress quickly. Right. OK, so we can summarize uh, these relationships between the tumor ecology and antigenic heterogeneity here in this table. Um, so if a tumor relies on or just tries to divide the immune system, you would expect uh, high T cell infiltrate, uh, low antigen burden, high recognition potentials, and low diversity, again, because it's kind of, you get this antigenic clone, it gets attacked and removed quickly. Um, and it never progresses to colorectal cancer. Uh, if it's get lucky, should expect low T cells, low antigen burden, recognition potentials, low diversity, 
because it's, it's really hard to get lucky, um, especially when these has to be a series of uh, fortunate events. And in this case, if that's the strategy, then progression is very slow. And then finally, if we have um, the get smart strategy of niche construction, have uh, high immunosuppression, so we'd expect lower T cells, which releases selection against antigenicity, so there can be a higher antigen burden and higher recognition potentials. And, right, it eventually becomes more or less neutral, so then you can have higher clonal diversity. And we saw before that progression can be quick. Um, so now we have sort of these expected patterns that we can go to the data and look for to try to determine what's happening in colorectal cancer and when. Uh, and we'll do this, again, um, using uh, immunohistochemistry and uh, neoantigen prediction. And our data set here is we have three kinds of tumors. The first are adenomas. Uh, the second are carcinomas. But then we have this really interesting sort of intermediate group where we, there's a carcinoma adjacent to and presumably emerging from its precursor adenoma. So this lets us look at a very early stage of uh, colorectal cancer. And it gives us a unique opportunity to look at a, an adenoma that's progressing versus one that at that time point was benign. So we can see how those are different. And then we can also compare the carcinoma to its adjacent adenoma and do really what separates these two, you know, like what are the ecologies different, I guess. Okay. So we'll start off by looking at the tumor ecology. Uh, for this, we have several different immune markers. Uh, so cytotoxic T cells, uh, CD8, we have CD68 or macrophages, uh, elastase for neutrophils, uh, CD20 is for B cells, and then we also have um, cytokeratin we'll use for epithelial cells and, you know, as a proxy for tumor cells, and then also uh, PDL1. In addition, we have some other environmental markers like vasculature and activated fibroblasts. Um, and we do this by looking at the entire tumor, so we don't just pick regions. It's this area that's masked is, you know, the adenoma or carcinoma. And this is the resolution that we're looking at right here. So it's the full resolution image. And we, uh, we go in and do stain segmentation. So we use positive pixel count as a proxy for cell abundance. Um, so in this case, it's um, elastase and SMA, so neutrophils and fibroblasts. Uh, we do this for all the different markers. Okay, And we'll start by comparing the tumor ecologies across these different groups. And to do this, we can use methods from ecology, which are very nice because it allows you to compare uh, tumors as a biological unit because you look at the entire mix of each cell. So you're not looking at the tumor cell type by cell type, but it's the mix, right? So you can compare them as, as a unit. And over here is um, how you can calculate one of these uh, ecological dissimilarities. So in this sample, you, know, you have the different uh, counts for each marker. So the brighter the color, the higher the count. Um, and they have another sample. And you basically take the difference in markers and add them up, normalize in some way, and you get how similar they are in composition. And using these dissimilarity the matrix, um, again, we can compare the tumors as units. And we'll see, it's pretty neat. Um, so one of the first tests we do is something called Permanova, which it's like ANOVA, but it works with these ecological distances. And it allows you to determine if uh, the ecologies between different groups are significantly different or not. And we can visualize this using a, this constrained analysis of principal coordinates, I think. Um, and in this case, so it's, it's very much like a PCA plot, except it takes into account this group structure that we're telling it exists. And when we come, first of all, we can see immediately that, uh, so purple here are carcinomas, red are the adenomas, and these are the carcinad samples. Uh, so it's immediately clear that 
the carcinomas uh, are very distinct from the adenomas, right? And they're, um, we can talk about the composition in a minute. But so, and then there's a lot of heterogeneity here in the uh, carcinad samples. So here we can show that they're very distinct. Um, and then we can do a few more tests to figure out how they're distinct. So one of them is uh, indicator species analysis. So it's traditionally used to figure out which species uniquely define an ecology. And in this case, we can use it to determine which of these cell types uniquely defines each stage. And <clears throat> for here, the uh, adenoma, the indicator species are cytotoxic T cells. So there's high predation and uh, pd one which is kind of surprising, I think. Uh, so it's under attack and it's protecting itself. It's not totally eliminated yet. Uh, moving on to the carcinoma, though, it's high T cells, um, high macrophages, high neutrophils, uh, vasculature. So this is often, I think, what's described as a as a hot or a cold ecology, right? So very immunosuppressive, few T cells, and the adenomas are the the hot ecology. So when you compare the two, it's definitely a switch from hot to cold. Okay. So again, we can compare um, the tumors. Um, but in this case, we're going to compare them within each group. So we can look at the amount of, you know, like how similar are carcinoma ecologies to all the other carcinomas. And same thing with adenomas. And this is uh, this PremDIS2 test. And again, it's, it's sort of like principal coordinate analysis where you reduce the dimensionality and figure out how far each sample is from its ecology's centroid, I guess. Um, so that's what this distance to centroid part is. Uh, so statistically, the adenomas and the carcinomas have similar levels of heterogeneity. Um, so they seem pretty low, like they have a common ecology. And then in this intermediate phase, we would argue that there's a lot of changes going on. So, you know, we, we pick up these uh, carcinoid samples, and they're all at different stages of what we'll consider this niche construction. Um, and it is interesting that it, at the end it converges um, to this very similar, which we just saw, cold carcinoma oncology. So it's like it's under control. Then there's all these changes, and then they all end up in the same spot. Uh, <clears throat> And then finally, another uh, ecology test we can look at is how the correlation between um, immune ecologies and environmental ecology. So here, the immune, it's a, uh, right, you know, CD8 cells, neutrophils, macrophages, B cells, all our immune cell markers. And the environment are, um, we described as, you know, the vasculature, tumor cells, pd one anything that can kind of modulate the immune response. And this positive relationship indicates that there's a correlation between the two. So as the environment changes, so too does the immune response and vice versa. So it indicates there's sort of this feedback, which again is consistent with a sort of niche construction. Um, okay. So I think that um, <clears throat> at this point, we, we can see that there are distinct ecologies, right? Through, through the different stages. And it appears to be the switch from um, hot to cold. Okay. But now we can break it down and look at those individual differences. And we'll start by comparing the benign adenomas to the adenomas that did progress. And when you, all oh, right, so let me explain this table because they pop up all the time. Uh, it's basically a table, like color coded table of p values. Um, and each column here, is a different statistical test that we used. Um, <clears throat> so we tried several different ones because they all make different assumptions. And we figured if you try different ones, the assumptions, if it's a true result, then you know, they should balance out and uh, be significant across many of the different tests. Uh, and then they also have directions. So greater means there is an increase in the cell type from the benign adenoma to the adenoma we know is progressing. And then Less is the decrease, and two-sided is just that there's some sort of difference. Um, so in this case, we can see that 
from the adenoma, the benign one, to the middle, or the one that's going to progress, there is a significant drop in T cells, accompanied by a significant increase in macrophages. So this indicates that one of the key things that's separating this adenoma that progressed from one that's benign is this early switching to a colder ecology, right? Uh, so it's not going to be immediate. So next we're gonna kind of look at how this changes through progression. And in this case, we're gonna assume that the carcinoma and these carcinoid samples would overtake the adenoma. And then so it would eventually become a complete carcinoma. So we're sort of assuming there's this progression. And here again, we, we see this um, over, over the three stages, this increase in uh, macrophages, vasculature, neutrophils, pd one proliferation. So again, see the niche construction starting early and then progressing on through the rest of the stages. And so that's across tumors. So the previous analysis was looking at changes across stage, but these uh, carcinat samples, we can compare the two subtypes in the same tumor. So we can see how is the carcinoma niche different from its precursor adenoma. And in this case, again, we see this <clears throat> high recruitment of uh, neutrophils in the carcinoma versus its uh, precursor adenoma, and also more macrophages and proliferation, uh, fibroblasts, a lot of the same things we saw before. So it's it's not, we just got lucky and saw it across the stage. It's, it's happening in each tumor. All right, so <clears throat> those are all individual changes, and, but we know that the cell types do not act in isolation. So especially, you know, with the tumor immune interactions, you have to consider co-localization in space. Um, so that was the next step, right? We know the ecologies are different. We know how the numbers change, but do the interactions actually change? And again, so our, <clears throat> our data, we have these serial slices. Each one is stained with two different markers. And ideally, you could just take them and stack them and then look at everything because it's all in the same place. But we'll see here in a second that that's not actually how it works out. Um, you know, like the sample can go upside down. It changes a little bit as it's sliced. It can get stretched on the slide. Lots of different reasons. Um, so can, to conduct the spatial analysis, we had to develop a new method to align um, serial slices. And uh, we're calling it VALIS, and we'll be publishing that later. James plug. Um, so anyway, so let, let's see the problem in the solution. OK, so this is for a, an adenoma. If we just took the slides and stacked them, this is after we run it through our pipeline. So everything's. Um, Everything's more or less in the right spot. It's not perfect. Uh, again, for various reasons, the tissues change as you cut through. They're thin slices, so they're not that far apart, but still it changes. Um, so what we do to account for that is we, after aligning them, uh, divide each sample into quadrats. And so in this case, it's while it's not cell cell perfect, everything is generally in the correct spot. So it's not too far off. And Again, we, we're doing this a whole resolution image. So when we do the stain segmentation, we're estimating abundance uh, of each cell type in each quadrat. And we can, again, borrow methods from ecology to take these quadrat counts and use them to estimate spatial interactions. Um, so this next slide is just an example of what the serial slices would look like after we've aligned them and conducted these quadrat counts. So in this, um, purple means low counts, and yellow is uh, high counts. So here we go. So we have this uh, for all the different images. And the, the spacing here is just to make it easier to see. They're really just a few uh, micrometers apart. So the, the alignment, like, well, I guess I just wanted to show what kind of data that we're actually working with. Um, and then, so we have this for all the different samples. And one thing you can see right away is if you look at all the different 
markers, you can see instantly that there's spatial segregation between some of these. And I think one of the more striking ones is, this wasn't a cherry-picked example, by the way. They're all kind of like this. Um, this. These are the tumor cells. And again, the, the brighter, the, uh, the higher the density. And the more blue, the lower the density. So these are tumor cells, and these are the T cells. And they are in totally different areas. Um, yeah, and you know you can look at uh, neutrophils, almost perfect overlap between them. Uh, and if, just as a preview to come, if you start up here in the adenomas and look at the same relationships, there's a pretty good amount of overlap between the T cells and the tumor cells. Uh, not so many neutrophils, but as you go down, you can start to see the segregation uh, increase. So, okay, so we have the quadrat counts for every image set this composite image. And now we can construct these spatial interaction networks. So again, these are with the quadrat counts. And there are a lot of different spatial statistics out there. But I like this one because um, some other ones, like nearest neighbor distances or uh, Ripley's K, you know, they, it's always pairwise interactions in isolation. Right, so you just get an idea of two cell types are closer than expected, and then assume that if they're closer than expected, they're doing something. Um, but what these interaction networks do is they take into account the whole spatial distribution of all the different cell types and construct the uh, interaction network based on that. So what it's able to do is remove these um, indirect effects, which could be an example would be if you had um, three cell types, A, B, and C, and you find A and B close together, and if you do the pairwise uh, statistics, you would think that they're interacting with, the, with each other because they're always close together. But maybe it's because there's the third cell type, C, that for some reason is causing them to be together. So it's not really that A and B are interacting together, it's that C is interacting with them, pushing them together, if that makes sense. So those would be the indirect effects, and by creating these interaction networks, it removes the indirect effects and you're just left these direct interactions. Um, so this is an example of one of the inter interaction networks that you would get. Um, it's a, the circos plots. And the color and width of each link uh, indicates the strength of the interaction. So blue means that the uh, cell types are found in different areas. Uh, red means they're often together. And so in this example, again, you can kind of see that the tumor cells and the T cells are very different areas, um, it, but that PDL1 and tumor cells are often in the same area. Um, and you know you can do this for every different combination. So we constructed this interaction network uh, for every sample that we had, and then did the same sort of analysis we did with cell abundances, um, but in, this time compared the weights of the interactions. And there, there's a lot of significant ones, but I think some of the ones most relevant uh, to this are this increase in interactions between uh, tumor cells and PD-01 from, again, this is from the adenoma and the carcinoid sample to its adjacent carcinoma to the full-blown carcinoma. So we see this gradual increase in co-localization of PD-01 and tumor cells, uh, increased interaction between tumor cells and neutrophils, again, and decrease in the interaction between um, tumor cells and T cells. And again, many, many more in here, but I think those are the ones that um, are most pertinent to this story. Okay, so that's the ecological analysis. And I think altogether, it's good evidence that in this adenoma stage, it's hot with lots of immune cell, or T cells, and that there's this early uh, switch to a colder or warm, maybe, ecology, and then a gradual transition to one that's very cold, with the few T cells and high immunosuppressive cells. Okay, so this, the, the ecology that we see is more along this uh, niche construction path. Okay, so the model predicts what the antigenic heterogeneity should look like. Uh, given this pattern, and it should, we should see high antigen burdens, high recognition potentials, high diversity, and fast progression to colorectal cancer. Um, 
So next, we're going to see if those patterns exist in these samples. And to do this, we used um, this pipeline that Ryan developed called Neode Pred Pipe, uh, another shameless plug. Um, <clears throat> so but it basically takes the whole exome sequencing data, runs it through this pipeline, and you get back the recognition potentials. Um, so that tells us how strong uh, of a T cell response each antigen should elicit. And so we can do this for all the different mutations and then compare it to the model. Right. So on the left here are the uh, simulations, more or less the same data as before, but just displayed differently. Um, but here are these sort of do-nothing tumors. Um, all right, so let me explain. So, um, so right, the x-axis is antigen burden. Y are the recognition potentials. And uh, the color of each box is goes along in this 2D color map. It's uh, supposed to be kind of like it's 2D strategy space, I guess. Um, so if it's down here in this green color, there has no growth benefit from recruiting immunosuppressive cells, and there's no protection. So it's the lucky category. And if it's up here in the opposite, it's smart because it's you know, evolve the ability to recruit immunosuppressive cells or express checkpoint inhibitors um, and has increased growth. Um, okay, so uh, a few things here. Oh, sorry, and these blue lines are trend lines. Um, so in the model, these uh, do nothing tumors, they again were sort of like flashes in the pan, so they had low burdens but high recognition potentials, and the line indicates that there is negative selection against this pattern, right? So the higher the burden, the higher recognition potentials, or sorry, they could have the higher burden, but there had to be fewer recognition potentials. But these tumors didn't last very long because they were too immunogenic. Um, so the rest of these are the simulated tumors that did progress. And I guess sort of one of the takeaway messages from here is just supposed to be that this very strong negative relationship, the um, smarter the tumor gets, the flatter that line becomes. So it becomes less important, right? There's less selection against the higher burdens and the higher recognition potentials. So instead of being negative, it just kind of flattens out because those uh, traits are irrelevant now, right? They don't affect the fitness. Enter simple model. Okay, so those are the patterns that we observe. And then we can look at the data. And it looks like many of these adenomas has sort of this do nothing strategy where it's a low burden, high recognition potentials. So, you know, maybe a sign that they're currently under control, you know. Um, they're eliciting a strong immune response and it's keeping the burden low. So, more along this do nothing strategy. But then we have this one over here that's getting the higher burden, but also lower recognition potentials. So, um, you see that Get Lucky had the lower burden, but this is getting the higher burden. So based on this alone, might suggest that it's using this Get Smart. Um, <clears throat> and I think this is pretty striking, is that up here there's this sort of negative relationship, but then we look at the adenomas that progressed and the adjacent carcinoma and then full-blown carcinomas. And in the model, the selection against burden and antigenicity just kind of becomes irrelevant. But in the data, it actually kind of increases for, for some reason. Um, so to me, that means that there, the selection against the burden antigenicity is it's really reduced, right? It, it doesn't even matter if it increases or decreases. It's, it just doesn't matter anymore. Um, and in the model, we can see that you only get this sort of pattern if it's these uh, smart tumors. So um, I think in all, this suggests that these, um, this strategy being used during colorectal cancer is this get smart strategy, and that it begins in the adenoma phase. So the benign adenomas remain under control, but then there can be this switch where the immunosuppressive niche begins to be constructed and then continues on through um, progression, and that without that construction, the tumors remain under control or are eliminated. So I think this idea that um, it is sort of this bottleneck in progression seems to uh, seems to hold up. 
Okay. So uh, some interesting and I think useful uh, clinical relevance to this. So one of them is we see that um, if there's an immune, from the model, if there's an immunosuppressive niche that the tumor can progress quickly and then we have the antigenic patterns associated with it. So it could potentially be a prognostic marker. So somebody comes with an adenoma and you see this, I mean, they kind of do this already, but like, you know, low T cells, high immunosuppressive cells, maybe this, you could just look at the antigen burden. Um, they could be at higher risk if they have sort of this get smart pattern. Um, so another thing is that if the carcinomas, or if niche construction is sort of like the predominant strategy in colorectal cancer, then that may suggest that immunotherapies that rely on T cells attacking the tumor cell may not be too effective because I mean, we can see from the imaging that the, uh, the T cells are in different places. So if they can't infiltrate the tumor, then stimulating a strong T cell response may not be as effective as trying to do something like remodeling the niche and trying to make it more uh, anti-tumor. So I know one of the things people are working on is trying to reprogram macrophages to go from M2 to M1. Um, so maybe that would be a more successful strategy. And then finally, neutrophils um, appear to be playing a very, very important role in, in all the ecological tests. It's, you know, always, associated, always increasing through progression in the same tumor. Interactions with tumor cells increase. So, you know, maybe it's... Um, in addition to looking at reprogramming macrophages, a similar approach with neutrophils. And uh, finally, I would just like to thank um, Sandy Anderson and Mark Robertson Tessie and Trevor Graham, who've kind of led the project um, and then worked with Annie on the immunohistochemistry. And Ryan developed all the, uh, the genomics pipelines that we used. And then, of course, Simon, uh, who was there from the beginning. Thank you.